Um, welcome. So this kind of stemmed out of uh, a few things. Uh, first of all, we realized that we were um, had a kind of a, a shortage and a need for um, some pasture-based production models related to things not just beef cattle. Uh, we found and, and had some people point out that a lot of the, the things that we were doing, events and uh, field days and pasture walks were largely focused around some sort of beef cattle, whether it was stockers or you know cow-calf or or maybe some dairy things, but we were kind of short in some of these other species like sheep production, bison, goats, um, uh, you know, and, and chickens and, and pastured hogs. And so that's kind of where the, the idea for this came out of, as well as uh, we, we did cohorts and kind of were hoping to create some networks uh, around similarly minded producers. And we started with producing uh, or cohorts uh, around just kind of regenerative ag producers and realized pretty quickly that that's a pretty broad net. Uh, we've got you know, dairy, we had a cohort with 10 farmers that had dairy farmers, uh, beef farmers, sheep farmers, crop farmers, and different scales of each of them. And to try and get some you know, benefit from everything was kind of difficult. Um, so then we did it just a grazing based cohort. And even that was pretty broad because we had bison and goat and sheep and beef producers. And so that was that along with just this recognition that we were not really producing or providing that much uh, information on some of these other livestock species as, uh, and production models kind of made us realize we needed to do something different. And so that's why we, we did this five week series on livestock, uh, different livestock species production models. And this is week five. Uh, if you just heard about this one now and wish you had heard about the other ones, uh, be sure to check out on our Sustainable Farming Association YouTube channel. They, uh, they're, they're, if they're not all up there now, they will be uh, as, as we get them edited and, and get them uploaded. They all should be on our YouTube channel, but we've got uh, one on pastured pork. That was our first, then pastured sheep production, uh, bison. Last week was goat production. And then this week obviously is pasture chicken production. And uh, what I hope to do uh, here in the next week or so is to send an email to everybody who registered uh, and start a Facebook or some sort of an email group. What we did was uh, with pastured hog production is kind of a trial run as a, a uh, cohort email group, uh, just uh, where you can email SFA hog cohort or SFA chicken cohort at gmail or at uh, googlegroups.com or whatever the thing is that I set up. And that email will go to everyone in the cohort so that we can network and continue to have conversations. And so if that's something you're interested in, um, in the next week or two, I hope to send out an email with an invitation to that. And if you're not interested, you just yeah, rejected or don't accept. And, and if you are, you're welcome to hop in there and then we can carry on some of the conversations and you have a route to send your questions um, for other producers doing similar stuff. So that's kind of the, the goal of that. I'm wondering if Dane has hopped on yet or not. If he is, you can just throw it in the chat. He's got something to share with the group on a pastured poultry event coming up uh, in the next month or so. Um, I don't, oh, there he is, Dane. Awesome. Can you hear me? If you are, yes, yeah, I can hear you. And if uh, you're okay, I'll give you, a, you know, five minutes or so right now or however long you need here, uh, if you're good to go at the moment. Yeah, I'll just take a couple minutes, but hello. Sure. Um, yeah. yeah, can you can you hear me all right? Yep, I got you spotlighted, so everybody should be able to hear and see you. Sweet. All right, sweet. Yeah, hello. Uh, my name is Dane McKittrick. I am with the uh, Clean River Partners, which is a nonprofit based out of Northfield that focuses on watershed conservation within primarily the Cannon River watershed, but also elsewhere. Um, and recently we've partnered with uh, the Regenerative Agriculture Alliance, uh, also in uh, Northfield. Their focus is primarily uh, silvopastured chickens. So they do a lot of what they call tree range chickens and they're trying to start up this whole ecosystem. They just brought a, bought a processing plant down in Stacyville, Iowa, and they're uh, gearing up and trying to really get some growers on the ground using these regenerative uh, poultry production uh, farming methods. And they're looking for new producers, uh, especially BIPOC farmers. So if you know BIPOC farmers that are having uh, chicken operations and looking to do something regenerative or with uh, silvopasture, this will definitely be for them. Um, so one thing that we're working on for March 10th and 11th is the poultry convergence. It'll be an event down in Stacyville, Iowa at their, or 
at um their new processing plant or actually sorry it's in albert lee uh at a conference center and there'll be two days a two-day event the first day is focused on silvopasture poultry uh production methods and talking to growers getting growers involved uh in sharing their stories with uh, poultry production uh, in this regenerative method, and just asking any new questions and any answering any questions that uh, potential interested growers might have for production of chicken in this system. Um, so yeah, that should be a great way to learn about the regenerative practices, get involved with the uh, not cooperative, but co not cooperative yet but um, ecosystem and uh, organization of uh, poultry producers that are growing in this regenerative manner. And then the second day will be more focused on the, the larger ecosystem of the agroforestry, poultry, tree range, chicken uh, system that they're trying to run. So there'll be people, be people talking from a marketing standpoint, a, a processing standpoint, um, a, ch a chance to share thoughts and opinions uh, in this larger network that the farmers will be a part of uh, in tree range chickens. So that will be again on March 10th and 11th. And I can share uh, with SFA uh, the registration to this and also more more detail on that after this after this call. So uh, stay tuned from him and I'll I'll be in touch with, with all of you and anyone who else wants to get interested and involved in free range chickens with RAA and clean river partners. I'm sorry, there was, oh, sorry, I thought there was a question. I didn't read it. Really. Yeah, just if you can get more information, would you mind sharing the link? I think I saw a website at one point, maybe in the chat. So anybody who wants to check that out can just pull it up today. Yeah, I'll look through my notes and I'll, I'll Try to find the link for the site and the convergence okay. uh and those in the next couple of minutes here awesome cool thanks yeah, yeah. no i appreciate it Go yeah ahead. and definitely if, if anyone knows anyone spread the word as far as can be uh any poultry producer that might be looking to do things a little bit more sustainably or get uh pastured uh, agroforestry going on their operation in some regard or in all regard that would be fantastic and this is meant for them so and maybe throw your email or contact information in the chat too, in case anybody wants to follow up with you. Uh, what they're they're doing is is pretty cool. Um, if the the tree range chicken brand, they're kind of gonna. I mean, one of the biggest challenges with raising pasture chicken for all of us is, is marketing. <laughs> I mean, that limits our largely limits uh, how much that we can uh, we can produce is is how much we can sell. So they're they're putting together the marketing program to take that kind of out of. The, the question to make that a little bit easier for us and let us focus on what we want to do as production as producers and produce chickens. So it's pretty pretty awesome uh, opportunity. Definitely worth looking into if it's something you want to uh, get more information. Reach out to Dane and he'll throw his information in the chat along with hopefully if you can find that link to the to the event. Um, otherwise, I think we'll move right along. Move? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so thanks for the opportunity. Um, Actually, sorry, Lance, just one thing I realized I should maybe, if if you have questions, throw them in the chat. Um, sorry, I, we do want to make sure we get your questions answered. Uh, I'm not sure if I'll interject if it's relevant to something you're saying at the moment or if we'll save them for the end, uh, but throw them in the chat just so uh, so you don't forget them and then we'll we'll get to your question at some point for sure. So sorry to cut you off. Just wanted oh, that's, to that. that, that's good. We talked about that earlier, so I'm glad you brought it up now. So, um, yeah, so uh, Lance Klessig and uh, good friends with Jared and Val. And um, I'll just preface by saying that we are young into our journey of raising hens, but uh, I'm happy to share some of our journey and, and also uh, things we're learning along the way. So, um, yeah, put, put a couple of slides up or a couple of pictures up here right away. Um, one is on the right. Those are two of my five kids. And if you notice that egg is um, being held in midair somehow, <laughs> at least temporarily, but we are, uh, we do have a number of, um, you know, we have families and whatnot that come out and um, I'll get into this, but we do have used the different cattle trailers and whatnot for our laying hens. Um, so I'm going to just go ahead here and kind of roll um, 
So again, I just I thought it's helpful to have some nice visuals of what we're after, at least our farm, Heart and Soil Ridge. Um, you know, a, a nutrient dense product that's attractive. And um, yeah, so this is actually a friend of mine, his picture. But um, again, this is kind of the goal that we're shooting for. We're shooting for multiple different colors of eggs, different kinds. Uh, we have lots of different hens. So, um, so before I really jump into it, I just wanted to kind of remind us what an enterprise is because um, at least remind myself, um, so a project or an undertaking that is typically one that's difficult or requires effort. And I would say that um, that is very true, whether it's pastured pork or uh, beef, whatever you're doing. Um, and then the second point is it's a business. And um, that's just a, I guess, a reminder for we constantly remind ourselves of we're not doing this just for fun especially when you start to scale, uh, like we have, um, at least for this year. So, um, so I'm going to share a little bit of our journey. Like I mentioned, we do have a pretty diverse farm, uh, a little bit atypical. Um, and so some of these are my kids here on the right. No, I don't have <laughs> that many, but we do have five children. Uh, and we do a lot of things on our farm about or regarding agro-tourism, and you'll get a little bit of a glimpse, uh, there. Um, so here's my family, my wife, Christine, and we have uh, five kids and, uh, the name of our farm is Heart and Soil Ridge. Um, I also do a fair amount of, of crop consulting. And, um, this is just a picture that we took out in one of our, uh, cover crop, uh, jungle mix plots this year. Um, through this picture in here, cause I was telling Jared before the call that my family, we homeschool. So. They're all down in Atlanta uh, with my wife on a homeschool adventure. And so we um, had them wear all their shirts. That way they're easy to track down in the airport, assuming if they get away, but, um, or get, you know, away from Chrissy. So, so on the right, this is actually, uh, I threw this picture in here just because um, up to a couple of weeks ago, we actually had a bunch of our hands out still on pasture or in the snow uh, because we had lost, um, a couple of our greenhouses, which I will show that in a minute, but this is a friend of ours that was actually helping me collect a pile of our hens to bring them back to the greenhouse. So just a little bit of context there. Um, let's see, I put this slide in there, just a little bit of an overview, but also kind of share some of our objectives. So again, we have lots of different enterprises. Um, and earlier this fall, I actually quit my job uh, working for a conservation organization. Um, um, Winona Soil and Water Conservation District. Um, and so our farm largely is centered on agritourism. We have uh, three different Airbnb rentals right on our farmstead. Um, and so we major in agritourism and hospitality, um, have very little equipment. So I'm looking to buy and trade all of the feed uh, that I need, own as little as equipment as possible, outwintering, um, and then you know, obviously direct marketing is uh, the, the avenue that we're trying to, um, you know, derive some income off of, of our farm. So, um, and one of the primary goals is to generate enough income to provide for our family or my family while trying new things. So there are some enterprises that we're trying just to see if they fit, um, but also if they're uh, positive as far as cash flow. Um, and I thought a little bit, it might be helpful to kind of think about like where we've come. So I labeled this our roots. Um, so I have some uncles that are big into grass-based dairying, like 450 cows on grass in Wisconsin. And then I grew up on New Hopestead Farms is uh, where we rotationally grazed our cow-calf uh, herd. Um, and part of my appreciation, our family's appreciation for running the land is just to, to take care of it, to love it, to steward it, uh, to be lifelong learners, and then follow in elderly Pete, Ella Leopold's uh, land ethic. Um, so again, just a couple pictures of, of the journey that got us to our farm, because we've only been here for a few years. Um, and um, so yeah, just a couple pictures. So here's a overhead of our farm. Um, and you can see that the buildings all have different numbers. Those are actually some of the rentals. Um, but our, our goal, our mission is for our guests to experience regeneration 
but also those that buy our products uh, by having nutrient dense eggs and pork, uh, beef, honey we produce. Um, so we'll get into the uh, meat and potatoes here. Um, I put this slide in here just because it's, um, it's humbling to raise animals. I think we all would relate to that. Um, it has been an adventure for us. Uh, here on our farm, we've had two hail events, uh, like could you see on the right there. Um, and we've obviously lost animals somewhat because of that, uh, all the chickens on the right there. Um, but it's, it's been a good adventure, and that's why I'm hoping to share some with you all. Um, here's another uh, drone video, or drone picture from looking east. Um, so I don't know if you can see up in the middle, uh, there's, let's see if I can start, highlight it there. So there are uh, four uh, cattle, no, three cattle trailers there that we've converted and we're moving them every couple days, try to do it every day, but turns out to be every couple days. So we're using a rollaway nest boxes in them and um, just marching them across the field um, is how we uh, raise our, our hens. Um, here's a couple of our different enterprises. Again, agritourism is highest on our list because that's the uh, biggest way we make income, but we are, are, are also raising pork and eggs, honey broilers, turkeys, um, and doing some custom grazing as well, um, so. So here's a little bit of the journey. Uh, like I said, we're three years into it. Uh, started out with about 50 hens. And last year we ran about 120. Uh, and then actually thanks to Jared and his wife, uh, we were able to pick up uh, 100 and some this fall. And um, we kind of keep things pretty simple. So on the right, you can see we actually have multi-purpose. Uh, these are what we call our hen houses or greenhouses that are just hog panels. Um, that are stretched and then um, we just wrap greenhouse fabric over top of them and put a door on each end. Um, and so uh, let's see the right picture on the left is just a couple of my kids and you know we have lots of different types of hens we're we're marketing um, to have colored eggs and so having lots of different rare breeds and olive eggers is, is part of our um, experience here and you can see here the kids have some of those different colored eggs and then we actually have aprons for our guests to wear or people that come visit us on the farm so they can wear them and pick their own eggs um so just a couple pictures here again of the kids we actually started our hens out in an old uh, granary there uh, before we got things set up and we're big on trying to social uh, market as far as different social media channels and so let me just see if I can, um, if this will play. So here's just a quick video of the kids. Hey everybody, we just wanted to introduce our roosters today. You go ahead, Eli. This rooster is, this rooster is still checking. His name is Ezekiel. Ezekiel. And this rooster's name is Ripcord. And we've got about 50 hens. We're going to be getting some more, and they are laying beautiful eggs. Oh, Ada wants to introduce her to Go ahead. And we have some chicks. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're getting more. That one is my is team. That one is team. Hey, everybody. All right, I cut it off there just because Grayson starts talking about chicken poop <laughs> on the video. But um, yeah, so a big thing, like I said, is 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 helping people understand how we're raising the chickens, um, whether it's broilers or layers or other products. So again, using videos and pictures. Um, and so I'm progressing here. This is 2020. And uh, what I'm showing here is on the right is then us getting you know day old chicks and raising them so this is my daughter vera and son liam uh, we actually use some old chicken tractors to um to raise them uh uh when once they got out of the house because we started them in the house believe it or not uh, a couple hundred little laying chicks um so again part of our marketing is when people come stay with us um you know they're out we give farm tours i just actually gave one today but four to five days a week so people are 
um, you know, on our farm and, you know, experiencing our pastures, our animals. And so it's a pretty easy way for them to buy a dozen eggs um, for five bucks a dozen. Um, and so this is, these are just a couple pictures of guests um, that are on our farm and, you know, most of them have never held a chicken. So, um, and then to be able to buy their own eggs and, and fry them up or take them home uh, is very rewarding for, for many of them. Um, let's see if this works. So here's an, actually a video I took um, yesterday, um, just kind of shows one of the greenhouses again. Let's see if I can get it to play because it kind of walks through our very crowded greenhouse. Well, here's just a quick view of our setup. And yeah, I just got done collecting some eggs and trying to get these girls trained back to lay in here. This is actually a brand new one. Um, just got done collecting eggs. Um, yeah, and the girls, you know, they roost on here. You know, nothing super fancy. It's an actual greenhouse, uh, hog pa or cattle panels with greenhouse tarps over it. So um, I guess, you know, this is what we're trying to avoid. Uh, and we are using corn stalk bedding and oats. So yeah, that's our, that's our system for now. And like, so we have a couple other greenhouses, so. Question in the chat for you <clears throat> was uh, if you have to provide heat or what kind of temperature does that greenhouse maintain uh, over winter right now? Sure. Um, so I don't have a thermometer in there uh, with there's about 120, 120 hens or so in this one, which is um, probably would like to more have closer to maybe 75 or 90. But just with our space limitations, that's what how we how we put them in there this fall, but their water will freeze overnight when it gets, you know, below zero, um, as well as their eggs. So we obviously collect in the morning and then at night when it's ultra cold. So to answer the question, it's actually pretty pleasant in there when it's 20 to 40 degrees, but actually over 40, it gets too hot. <laughs> um, we actually open the back window. Um, and then when it's ultra cold, um, well, we can't do a whole lot about that, but um, yeah, that's that's kind of our sit up, setup. We do not run any lights, uh, so that means our production dropped almost nearly to nothing here oh, a couple weeks ago, or yeah, around the first of the year, I guess. And so now with the daylight, they're finally starting to, to pick back up. And then a couple more on that. Uh, do you move the greenhouses yearly? Or are they permanent locations? And then what are the dimensions of the greenhouse? Uh, so the, this greenhouse has not moved. We actually, once the hens, we kicked the hens out in, oh, first part of April, then we actually use it as a greenhouse for plants and whatnot. Um, so all, also with this amount of chickens, uh, that means we clean that greenhouse out a couple times during the winter when it thaws out on a decent few days. So um, there's a lot of nutrients there. Um, I think the plan would be to, to move them um, but we just haven't done that here in the last couple of years. Um, as far as dimensions, I think they are, um, are they 10 foot wide? I think the panels are 16 foot. Um, so, and they're obviously bowed in a horseshoe and then they're just treated two by sixes that are kind of, um, bolted together as far as the frame on the bottom. And we do put up, if it's supposed to be heavy snow or like a wet snow, we do put up some like two by sixes or two by fours to just to make sure it doesn't cave in on them. Um, Cause that can be a lot of weight. Uh, let's see, I'll keep rolling. Oh, sorry. Um, one more here. Um, yeah. So here's just a couple pictures. I wasn't sure if the video was going to work. So that's, um, I just already showed that, but um so that was, you know, kind of leading and that's 2020, 2021. Uh, like I said, we uh, traditionally have, have gotten day old chicks and raised them. And, you know, but there's a significant amount of time to doing that, obviously labor as well. So this year we've decided we actually put some money down on a bunch of pullets that will come, I think they're the end of April or first week of May. And um, we just felt that our cost to raise the chicks not that it i mean it's fun for our kids but 
we can only major in so many things. So we're actually not going to buy any um, any little baby chicks, day old chicks. We are um, going the pullet option and pretty affordable. And, you know, then they're ready to lay. I mean, they're starting to lay right when you get them. So that's one change that we're making. Um, just, yeah, from a labor standpoint and also a death law. I mean, it's easy if if you don't get your barn, we start our chicks in the house and then we moved them out to the barn into brooders, heat lamps and all that. And if you're not careful on cool nights, they can heap up on each other. And so we've had enough experience losing, you know, a few here, a few there that um, it's, we feel it's at least worth trying it to buy, you know, $8 pullets um, that are ready to start laying. So that's just one observation I guess I thought I would share it's an option we really hadn't thought about but there are plenty of people that are um, that's what they do you know they raise 500 or a thousand at a poll and then two weeks later they have another 500 or a thousand chick day old chicks come in and they raise them so there are options like that okay so I put this picture in here I know it has not a lot to do with <laughs> raising broilers that Jared's going to talk about or raising laying hens um, but I put the Starbucks coffee in because I think a big question is, is how do we, how do we market our eggs and get paid a fair price? Right. And, um, I'm a coffee drinker and drink Mountain Dew, but, um, you know, so much of our society, it's built on uh, cheap food, but also spending, in my opinion, some pretty good money on, you know, signature coffee drinks like this. And, um, so I guess I just, I wanted to put these in here to kind of frame, well, what do we charge? Because um, I believe full heartedly that we are what we eat. And we're also having lots of um, health issues in our country because of so much of our food just does not have the nutrients, the densities in them. And um, so that's a, that's a big selling point in even just cracking an egg open and comparing it to a, a, a lower or cheaper option and help having people taste the difference. So that's one thing that we actually, we, do, we give eggs away to help people taste the difference. And many times they come back to become our buyers, you know, buying our eggs. Um, so here's a picture of some eggs from this summer. Um, I pose a question here. Um, we market our eggs as a monthly subscription, which, um, isn't isn't a it's I guess it's just a wording thing right so if I ask you are do you want to pay five dollars a dozen or are you willing to um pay 20 bucks a month for a, a subscription of eggs surprisingly the 20 dollars a month really has a very different meaning and many people will just be like yeah that's yep no problem 20 bucks a month you know I have my cell phone payment I have vehicle or house payment but when you ask them for five dollars a month or five dollars a dozen um, that raises some eyebrows because they're used to spending a dollar and a half or two dollars or whatnot at a store, grocery store, or you know, quick convenience store. So part of it is I think how we how we present our products, right? Um, another thing I want to point out with a picture, this is a picture my wife took. Presentation is huge for us. That's partially why we are not just having uh, brown eggs, but having the olive eggers. And we also go as far as using our own kind of specialized cartons that we um, stamp with our logo. And then it also says on the side, we stamp it and it says happy hens and the date that the eggs were laid. And then on, we can put it in pen, the, the actual date. Again, it's, it's a way that we are trying to build recognition uh, and also loyalty to our farm by them seeing our Heart and Soil Ridge logo. Um, so again, we're, we're trying to um, I guess, create an experience, a positive experience so that people, they were marketing them, they know where our eggs, you know, how they're raised via YouTube, and sharing pictures of our kids with the, the hens and whatnot. Um, so yeah, that's just a little bit of what we're trying to do. We do um, on Thursdays, when we go into town as a family for chiropractor, then we do uh, drop eggs uh, at a handful of places. And actually just today I talked to our chiropractor about making uh, her parking lot a, uh, a drop point. So from an hour per, an hour a week, 
will be there at Thursday, say from two to three and people can come pick up their eggs. And so that's a system that we're definitely migrating towards just because it's not economical for us to drive six dozen eggs to this spot and 10 dozen to this spot, that type of thing. Um, broilers, I'm going to let Jared um, get into that. Uh, but again, presentation, I got, I want to just stress that whether it's um, whether it's something like this and how you market your eggs or uh, something like this, you know, we hired a food photographer actually hired, but also traded some of our, our uh, pastured products. Um, because again, we're trying to help people envision what kind of products they're getting from us. Um, and it is helpful to differentiate uh, ourselves from maybe what they can buy in the store. Um, so I'm about ready to wrap up here, Jared, but I, I wanted to kind of end by providing some food for thought. Um, part of it is really, how do you share your journey? And there's lots of different methods to that, but I think it's very important if people are going to trust you to spend five, six, eight dollars for a dozen eggs, uh, they we need to inform them, right? That's part of our job is, is being their farmer. Um, and, you know, I have a friend that um, doesn't live very far away and she ships eggs all over the country and the base price is 11 bucks a dozen. And then she tacks on even some to cover the shipping. And so to see her be able to do that on a, a scale of with a couple hundred hens gives me hope and um, optimism for, you know, where we're at and where we're trying to grow into. Uh, another point is just, how do you spend your time? Like I grew up farming full time with my parents and we didn't spend very much time marketing and, and uh, through some different avenues we were trying to spend about a third of our time marketing our product um, and farming the other two thirds. So just, again, some food for thought there. Um, who is your ideal customer? Uh, that's a really good question that we've had to answer and also define. Um, and so, cause we're not, we're not trying to market to everybody. We are trying to market to certain, certain type of person and um, this has kind of come through some farm coaching that we've done. But again, what kind of spending habits do those people have? Where can we locate them? Um, you know, is it, is it a farmer's market? Is it, um, you know, your chiropractor, some of these different, you know, food co-ops, that type of thing. How do you get in touch with the people that are willing to buy your product, um, understand the value of your product? So, um, I guess I'd encourage you, if you haven't thought about who your ideal customers are, uh, spend some time doing that. Um, invest in yourself and your farm. Uh, these are a couple different avenues that we've chosen to go down. Soil Health Academy is a good one. I know Jared and, and Val and several others on the call have been to that. Uh, Charlotte Smith Coaching, that's actually one of our, our farm coaches. She helps in marketing. Um, holistic management's another one. Uh, we did part of their course here uh, a couple winters ago. Ranching for profit uh, is another option for um, more so for cattle, but again, another one to uh, look into. Uh, let's see, visit who? So I think, I guess I want to just commend you all for being on the call and, and trying to learn more and network. Uh, but one thing that we put down this year is a list of farms that, that Chrissy and I want to go see. Um, and see what they're doing, learn from them, network. And so be very intentional about not trying to recreate the wheel and um, learn from other people that are doing what you want to do or that what you're doing. Um, create a peer group. That's an outstanding way to learn. Um, again, like-minded people, positive people. Um, I really like your idea, Jared, of the, the Google groups or however you put it together about those that are uh, doing pastured pork and, and how we can learn from each other. So uh, with that, here's an example of a peer group. Yes, that's Jared on the right and uh, Jordan and Cliff. Uh, this was at a, a pastured pork or a pastured pork walk, pig walk um, that, that Jared actually hosted. And so again, just an opportunity to be learning from each other and networking. So just an encouragement to get out and learn uh, some more. Um, so that this is our, um, our contact information, our website. And I think with that, Jared, I am, um, going to pass the baton off to you.
Awesome. All right. Um, I think maybe we'll take five or 10 minutes here to go through some of the questions that were specifically around your your presentation before we go to mine, just because mine's a little bit uh, different focus and stuff. Um, I had the one that just popped up here last. You opened to giving tours of your farm to us. I, <laughs> Sure. Well, you can. Uh, yeah, um, we're actually going to do um, at least one, if not two, open farm like pasture walks to kind of help people um, see what we're doing. And uh, I mean, we do it regularly, but um, yeah, feel free to text me or we can yeah. set something up. So awesome. Maybe I'll have to have another field day down there uh, in that, that portion of the state at your place. Um, Next question here, do you have, uh, do you have to stay at the drop location or could you just drop them off and let people pick them up? Um, I think it's once it's established, you sure could. Um, what we're doing is, um, you know, the one thing that comes to mind is how are you gonna get paid? But we actually ask, we try to invoice everybody a month ahead of time. So um, yeah, I think if people are open to that, I don't see why you couldn't do that. You just have to have a, a common spot. And um, I guess it's worth a try. We've, we've not done that, but mm -hmm. I think that's a good idea. Uh, will you talk a little bit more about the spaces you rent? Um, so yeah, that's, so we have uh, three on-farm rentals. We bought this farm with those buildings actually here. Um, and it was a, it's an opportunity for me actually to step away from my full-time job. So we have people that come um, pretty much every weekend. We're, we're solid. We're booked solid. And some of those people are just here because it's convenient. We're only three quarters of a mile off the interstate. Uh, but lots of our folks are coming from urban backgrounds to live on the farm for a day or maybe even a half a week or almost a week, some of them. And so, um, again, we are, you can look us up online. It kind of shares more about our on-farm agritourism and, and the stays that we have available but that's that's a been a very good avenue for us so without getting in a whole lot of uh the details um, we have a lodge a bungalow and a cottage um and the lodge actually has a indoor swimming pool that um the previous owner dug out of a like a machine shed so that's that has its own following just in and of itself um so I'm curious actually on, on that uh, with, cause you're selling a lot to those guests. Are they usually locals or are they from a long ways away? And can you maintain customer relationships with them if they're a long ways away or? Um, yeah, so that's a good question. I would say a majority of our guests are from the twin cities, Madison, Milwaukee, um, some fair amount from Chicago actually. So um, what we do is we, um, we have a, a nice little card where people can leave us their, their email address and then they can get our uh, newsletter updates, but also, you know, if we have a special on products um, so they can hear about it that way. And um, like I said, a lot of it is, you know, it's experiential when people go on vacation. Like if I go on a fishing trip, I don't really think a whole lot about spending, you know, $12 for a, a package of bacon or for, you know, like, or it's just, you're in a different mode. And so also when you're here and you get to go meet the animals, it's, it's very different. And so, um, we, we tend to not, we have lots of people that want to buy our products. So we actually have, I think six or seven freezers now that, um, we are trying to keep as stocked as we can to sell mm -hmm. beef and pork and uh, whatnot. So. Awesome. Um, how do you wash your eggs? Uh, <laughs> so we do not have an egg washer, uh, in summer, we actually, with the rollout egg boxes, um, we have, oh, I would say 90% of them. We don't end up having to wash and there are some rules slash guidance on, um, the legality of washing eggs. So in general, we try to, if we're going to sell the eggs, they're unwashed with the, the natural bloom on them if we have a fair amount that we had to wash, then we, um, you know, basically give them away or, you know, at least notify the people just to kind of keep everything open, you know, because this type of year it's hard with, if they're, especially if they're laying down in the bedding and stuff to have hundred percent clean eggs. 
a friend of our, oh, this is from my wife. I don't know which friend she's talking about. A friend of ours is getting layers soon and wanted to ask favorite breeds for a variety of colored eggs. That's a good question. I think we have 30 different kinds. Uh, we like diversity. Um, as far as egg production, just your ice and browns. And, and I think there's several good leghorns. There's some good breeds that produce a fair amount of eggs. Um, I, yeah, that would, I would have to defer that to my wife because we bought some very expensive little chicks <laughs> um, to get some of these different colored eggs. Um, so more to come on that. She can reach out to us and I could have Chrissy maybe um, follow up with her. So um, how big did you say the greenhouse was? And you said it would ideally hold 75 chickens, correct? Question mark. Yeah, it's, um, I think it's about 10 foot wide by one, two, three, four, five panels. So those panels are six inches. So yeah, you're looking at four, I think right around 20, 24, 24 feet, if I had to guess, something like that. Um, and yeah, like I said, we had three greenhouses and we lost one in the big windstorm here a couple months ago. So we have a lot of our hens grouped up um, too tight, but that's just, that's what we're making do for this winter, so. Cool. Um, how do you manage the flock health program and what are the most common challenges for pasture-raised chicken? Um, so, I mean, we're feeding a non-GMO feed from uh, Kit down at High View. And um, as far as um, like health and whatnot, I mean, Predation is kind of our big thing. We do actually have a guard dog that stays out with our, our goats and our, our laying hens and um, yeah, raccoons. So, I mean, yeah, we haven't had a whole lot of predation issues, but it's definitely like, you know, the idea that when you build the habitat, they will come for like, if you're a deer hunter or a pheasant hunter, well, we have hawks and eagles and some owls much more regularly now just <laughs> roosting on the trees. So right now we use the, the green or the, the hen wagon, the modified cattle trailers, they all roosted there at night. And then we are trying as best we can to keep our goats and sheep with the guard dog nearby. Um, so that's, yeah, I don't know if that answers the question, but that's what we've done so far. Sure. Cool. Um, <clears throat> it's 645 here now on my phone. So I think I'm gonna move on. Uh, we got a few more questions that we can get to at the end of mine, um, if that's sure. all right. Um, if you want to go ahead and unshare screen, then, well, maybe if I share mine, it'll automatically bump you out. But, um, and feel free to throw your information in the chat again in case people didn't take it down um, so they can still reach out to you. Um, All right, so I'm not gonna be able to see questions in the chat here and stuff. So if there's anything important that I miss, uh, I'll get to it at the end. <laughs> uh, sorry about that. Uh, can everybody see mine? Lance, can you can you see mine? Yep, I can here? see it, yep, cool. you're good. Awesome. All right, well, uh, thanks again, guys. Yeah, this uh, I'm gonna talk a little bit more on the bro broiler side. Uh, we don't have any laying hens, so I don't really have any in fact that was my my first uh, enterprise when I was a kid I saved up my like my whole life savings of $200 I bought like 50 laying hens when I was a kid um lost them all to a fox and a chicken hawk and an eagle or something and uh did it again a few years later when I was like 11 lost them all again uh to to some other wildlife and so uh, I'm still a little uh, burned by the the laying hen thing so I've stuck to broilers where I can protect them a little better I guess at this point but I appreciate that, that Lance. Um, so this is uh, our, our family and uh, I farm in Good Hue, Minnesota with my dad, John, my wife, Valerie, and hopefully someday our son, Colton. Uh, my dad's wife wasn't there for the day we had somebody come out and take photos, but I really like this photo. So that's the one I'm using. Um, unfortunately, she's not in it. Um, but uh, we, we farm about 700 acres here in Good Hue, Minnesota and, and raise a registered Red Angus beef cattle. Uh, we're calving about 230 uh, or so cows this spring and, and keep growing that as we transition more of our acres into pasture um, and out of crops. Um, and then uh, uh, we, we raise a 
uh, we're raising the pasture broilers that we're marketing primarily through our 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 brand grass-fed cattle company um and uh we we took over grass-fed cattle company actually from a, another couple in the cities that was raising pastured or that was marketing pastured uh meats uh, pastured pork and grass-fed beef uh but they weren't actually farmers they were just wanting to uh, source meat for themselves and realize there were other people in the city so maybe would want that as well and so they kind of built a brand around it and we we sort of took that over from them um and uh because we saw that as a really potential potentially big part of our farm we, we wanted to move our farm more in the direction of raising pasture uh instead of crops on our land even though it's very productive cropland and realized that we needed premium markets and of some sort to be able to uh, to make that really profitable and to be able to compete, especially when we're trying to sustain multiple families on what is otherwise considered a relatively small farm. I was kind of raised being told you need a thousand acres per family to farm full time. And so we're trying to do two families on 700 acres, um, which is, uh, is just not, um, not enough, I guess, in the uh, in the convention or commodity type system and model, and so that's why uh, we we did the grass fed cattle company. And as soon as we we took it on, we we asked people what they wanted, what were they missing at the time. The previous owners were only raising or selling beef and uh, and pork, and we had a huge amount of customers requesting pasture chicken. Um, and we thought that's you know something we can do pretty quick, uh, pretty easy. It's a low upfront cost. As a you know young couple trying to get into farming, if we wanted to go the beef route and, and generate our own income off of a beef farm, we would have needed you know 100, 200 cows and several hundred acres, and uh, that just wasn't really in the cards. It's hard to find land if you can find it at all. It's really expensive, and cattle are expensive too. But chickens is you know, relatively low upfront cost. I'll talk a little bit about the costs uh, a little bit later. Um, it's also a really quick turnaround. Pasture grass-fed beef is can be two years or more, whereas uh, chickens in six, seven, eight weeks you can have uh, chickens ready for uh, ready for slaughter. So you can get your cash back out of them a lot quicker. Uh, they're fantastic for building soil when you can import all that fertility in uh, in the form of chicken feed and put it through a chicken and and um, and they deposit it and scratch it into the soil with, with their natural, you know, habits and stuff. It's pretty cool what we've been able to see and do with the soil with chickens. Um, and they can have a really good return on investment uh, and, and they're very scalable. Um, and, you know, I, as I kind of talked about getting into farming as a beginning farmer uh, here, if we wanted to generate a living on cattle, we'd need hundreds of acres. But uh, if we can build the market, we can produce enough chickens to make a living on less than 10 acres if we if we have a market and so it can be quite scalable and we saw that as an opportunity for for ourselves um i guess something else i didn't put on here but uh you know we have a newborn seven month old and stuff and we're excited about you know being able to do something with him that we otherwise maybe wouldn't have been able to to do um you know with cattle or something we can have a little more participation with our family uh, in that way um, this summer, we got a grant, two grants actually. One was from the Department of Ag, Minnesota Department of Ag Sustain, Sustainable Agri Grant, um, Agriculture Research and Innovation Grant, um, I think is what it was, uh, stands for, as well as a SARE grant to do research on different feed types. Uh, one was a corn and soy, a non GMO corn and soy feed, and the other was a um, corn and soy free. Here's our, our brooder. Um, on the, the right there, that's that because of that grant, we had the four different groups. And so you'll see in the picture kind of four groups, and that's the reason we have four groups. Otherwise, we look forward to the summer being able to run everything in just one. That'll make life a lot, a lot simpler. Um, but uh, it's important in a brooder to have round pens. Uh, if, if not, the day old chicks, they can get themselves kind of pinned in a corner and, and kind of trample and, and cram each other and stuff. And so having round pens, especially early on, uh, keeping them moving and, and they don't get stuck in a corner can be helpful. Uh, we learned the hard way how important temperatures are and uh, maintaining temps. Um, the uh, uh, one in our third batch kind of later in the fall when it was a little bit cooler at night, one of the heat lamps in that bottom left uh, went out overnight. And so two are still working, 
but one had gone out and we lost over 30 chicks in the next two days out of that group uh, just just from one of those heat lamps going out um, and so kind of to the, the information a little more information on the, the temperatures here is just something we found um, line that we kind of go by at least in those first two weeks um, we uh, we try to maintain the temperatures around that 90 to 93 degrees um, for the, the first two two weeks. And, and as soon as week two comes, uh, after two weeks, we look at the seven day forecast and whatever day looks nicest is the day we plan to move them out to pasture. Um, some people you know, maybe have said, we probably should keep them a little bit later in the brooder. And if it's really cold and nasty, we will, but we've had pretty decent luck after two weeks, bringing them out to the to pasture and we like to get them out there as quick as we can but uh, in that brooder that diagram on the left kind of is a good visual if you don't have a thermometer you can just kind of kind of visually see if the chickens are too hot or too cold and adjust the heat lamps up or down based on that um, but uh, yeah um, so the pasture set up when we started this back in 2019 I think it was this would be our third year this was our third year 2021 uh, we went with the Soliton style chicken tractors that, that Soliton is named after Joel Soliton who kind of designed these. They're a 12 by 10 little box that you can kind of see in the background in that picture. I kind of realized I was trying to put this together. I didn't have any good photos of the, the, the uh, tractor, chicken tractors themselves. Uh, so you get to see my wife holding the chicken here with them in the background, but I, I like this photo too. So um, the, uh, the, the chicken tractors each hold about 100 birds. And we had little feed troughs, essentially trough feeders that would, uh, we had two or three in each thing and we had to fill them twice daily. And the five gallon waterers uh, were not very convenient. They were just kind of like big jugs that we had to pull out, bring over to a hose or a faucet and, and fill up and then carry back. And so it was pretty inefficient, um, pretty labor intensive to feed and water the chickens every day. Um, and we move them daily with the dolly we would have gotten the next video here, but um, the cost to build one of these is under 500 bucks. Um, and so it's pretty low cost to get started. We built two of them so we could raise 200 birds at a time and we did two or three batches a year so we could raise, you know, between 600 and uh, or 400 and 600 uh, birds a year. And we could do four or even potentially five batches if we really uh, tightened it up and, and, and you know, kind of uh, did it as best as we could, but um, just to kind of give an idea of the, the cost of that in initial structure here, and, and here's just the moving. You can see a little dolly I welded up with some scrap steel and the feed troughs there that we had to pull out and set on top, and we pulled them forward. We moved them forward to a new chunk of grass every day, just like that. Um, we didn't really know if predators would be an issue. So the first year we put that woven netting, electric netting around it, and we moved that netting even though they didn't actually have free range. So that's why the netting is around it. Uh, it was just, you know, making us feel a little better maybe that there wouldn't be some predators or a little less predator control or issues there. Um, but with the exception of one instance where we had six chickens that were too small to go to the butcher that we kept around, uh, and and then we didn't move them for like a week at a time because there were six in this whole thing and stuff. We have that those six chickens we did have a predator get in and, and kill all but one of them and stuff. And uh, other than that, we've never had a predator issue uh, that we know of with this model. And so we've stopped using the netting and just use the pens. But uh, that was the setup we we started with, and we were happy with that. Uh, but we wanted to scale it. We wanted to raise more chickens. Our customers were. You know, every time we bring in 200 birds, they were gone before we could, uh, you know, within a, a week of having them listed on our website. And so we wanted to scale it. And so we moved to, uh, we moved to what we have now, which is the Cobb Creek Mobile Range Coop. Um, it's actually manufactured uh, in like Northfield or kind of over in just south of the cities. Um, but it's 36 feet by 20 feet wide. And again, there's four sections here that we've divided for this research group and stuff, but we plan to pull those out this year. Um, and you can already kind of see the, the birds to the right of the photo are bigger than the birds to the left. So you can maybe guess which feed types are which. Um, it's kind of, uh, it was kind of pretty obvious which feed types did better in, in that situation. But um, we can fit five to 600 birds in that uh, hoop house without much trouble. 
Um, there, and it's made our lives a lot easier with all of this setup that you can see in there. We have automatic bell waters. There's four or there's eight total, two for each group um, in this situation, but they'll just be for open access. And they're plumbed into a half inch black poly pipe out that run along the top to the end. And then we just have a quick coupler disconnect that we run a garden hose that we have, we have water line and, and, uh, and faucets all over the farm for our cattle production. And so we just tap it right into that. And so when we move it, we just unhook the water, pull it forward and then hook the water back up and they're good to go. Um, then we have those 12 bulk feeders, which I think are 40 or 50 pound bulk feeders each. And so we have, there's more than enough feed in that to even when the chickens are, you know, at seven weeks and eating the most, uh, more than enough feed to, uh, uh, feed them only once a day so we didn't have to do twice a day checkups on them which made our life a lot easier um i'll show you the photo in the next one that uh or in the video in the next of how we move it forward we just pull it with our pickup truck and tow straps and the cost uh was a little bit cheaper for us uh but with i was looking at it not too long ago to see what it sells for now and, and now the cost to build this and get all the stuff situated in there was around ten thousand dollars um, something to consider 500 versus 10,000 is that, 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 that last one only hold 100. So if you want to have six of them to hold what this can hold, uh, that would be $3,000 worth of, you know, building materials versus 10,000. So still significantly cheaper. Um, but the efficiency has gone up tremendously on this. We're able to move 600 chickens in the same time or less probably than it took us to move 200 chickens uh, earlier. And, uh, and it would be even faster if we didn't have the four different groups and the two different feed types that we had to do, you know, fill and, and different, you know, run different feeds. We actually have a one ton bulk feeder on wheels that we pull out to the pasture um, and we just fill five gallon pails. And so it's pretty uh, low effort to, to fill the feeders, but that's allowed us to be more efficient with that as well. Um, I think this video is taken when there's not chickens in it, but you can kind of just see how we pull it forward a foot or two at a time, just giving chickens a chance to move ahead. Um, and because of the fact that there were the four divisions, um, we needed two people to move them forward. And my wife would be in the back, kind of moving the groups forward and on the phone with me, letting me know if I'm gonna run something over and when to stop. And um, But we're pretty confident, we, we actually did move it a few times with just one person. And we're pretty confident once we pull those things out that we can go to the back, move them all up pull it forward several feet at a time and do it all with one person and move 600 chickens and feed and water them in less than 15 minutes or 20 minutes um, uh, once we pull out these dividers. So we're pretty excited about that. That'll make life easier, but we did have to do it with two people um, uh, this year because of all those dividers and stuff. Um, oh, I'm gonna skip that, sorry. Um, yeah, so chicken breeds, um, there's three main, well, there's two main breeds that we considered. Uh, one breed that we were kind of forced into that I'll talk in a little bit about, but the considerations with them, uh, time to finish is the big one uh, between the, the two main breeds that I we've considered are Cornish Cross and uh, the Red Rangers or Freedom Rangers. Um, kind of their health um, and mobility and foraging instincts kind of all go together. Um, and, and what you want out of your bird to be able to, for them to be able to do and then meat quality and quantity. Um, the one that we, we've gone with every year with the exception of one incident uh, is Cornish Cross. Um, we started raising them the first year in eight weeks. Uh, we bumped it down to seven weeks last year and we think we may bump it down to five, uh, six weeks next year because we can pretty consistently get uh, the weights we want pretty quickly. Um, they're great meat quality. I mean, these birds were bred for meat and meat production and meat quality. So they have lots of high quality meat, and a, a large breast meat, which is the most valuable cut of the, uh, of the chicken and, and really just good quality. Um, their cons is they're not really the best of foragers. They will go around and do some kind of foraging and scavenging for bugs and eating forages and stuff. We are surprised with how much they do, um, but they're not that active, especially as they get bigger. They don't move around as much as they, they do when they're out there at the start. And they do have a higher mortality. Uh, they're bred to grow, and and sometimes they just have these sudden death syndrome things and heart attacks and flop back on their backs and, and just kind of die. And so they definitely have 
more than, than the freedom rangers um, that are great act, you know foragers healthy birds more active um, and i thought i had a photo in here but i guess i don't um, and then uh, but their cons is they take longer to finish out um, and they have less breast meat and stuff um, from my understanding um, but they are from what i've heard we've not raised them the best kind of uh, combo like if you're looking for a bird that's more of an active foraging bird they're about the best you can get um, the one incident we have that we were not so happy with is the first year they sent us uh, on, on the second or third batch like a hundred of these delawares possibly some cross with a delaware or something um we we noticed early on the, the speckles on their feathers and we're like uh oh I, I hope this isn't a big problem it was a pretty big problem you can see here in like two or three weeks when they're still in the brooder how much different how much bigger the uh the uh court the regular cornish cross were to the um to the court or to the the delawares and stuff so we were pretty disappointed um with those delawares they were fantastic foragers because they didn't eat any feed hardly. They just didn't do anything. All they did was run around and, and try to you know, hunt bugs and stuff. And they were pretty hardy birds too. You can see that photo on the right there. It was in November, there was snow on the ground. It was very cold. <laughs> we were decked out in bibbed overalls and a jacket and they were just fine. Um, they finish in they finished for us in over 16 weeks and the only reason we brought them in at 16 weeks was because our processor was closing down uh, for winter and we needed to bring them in and they were small they had weird meat texture kind of stringiness um, and then kind of a joke <laughs> uh, we had one night experience where we got out there a little bit late for chores um, it was right before dark and if you have not experienced chickens are kind of like zombies after dark uh, we drove out there, my wife did, she drove out there and the chickens just like full on swarmed, like, like just took uh, all charge the, the Can-Am and there were literally probably 60 all over the Can-Am. They just hopped in the back under the tires in the wheel wells on the steering wheel. They just hopped on it and took over. Um, and, <laughs> and you couldn't move them because after dark, they're just like zombies and we would set them to the side and they like crawled back slowly and jumped back in. And so we ended up having to, she ended up having to walk home in the dark <laughs> and uh, leave that out till morning when they, they start, started going around. But I uh, would not recommend that breed, but it was just an experience we had that was uh, unfortunate. Um, and we, I think just here, uh, not too long ago, got through the last of those chickens that we had in our freezer, um, like a uh, hundred of them or so that we had to slowly eat, but didn't really enjoy, but we're through them now. Um, the research grant we did um, was, again, on those two different feed types, the corn and soy, and then a corn and soy free feed. Um, and this is the, the thing that we found that we we thought we were told anyway we tried to keep the variables as, as close as possible so we planned to butcher everything at seven weeks uh, like we were planning our cornish or our uh, corn and soy feeds uh, we realized within days that wasn't going to work but unfortunately the processor was already pretty well packed and so we had to take whatever dates they could give us for the corn and soy free ones once we bumped them back and so the first group we had to keep for 70 days, the second one for 55, and the third group for 64 days. Um, but you can see group one and group four for each batch were the corn and soy, and they were all kept for 48 or 49 days. Um, and then the, the groups two and three were the corn and soy free ones. Um, and then the black line is the, the weight of the, the actual meat of the, the bird. Um, that we that we had after processing, um, we we got them processed at AA Poultry in Wisconsin. They did a fantastic job, and they were so great working with us when we called and had to move all of these dates, and they were fantastic. But we had to take the dates that they could get us in, so that was kind of the hassle. But you can just kind of see, uh, you know, this this first group here uh, at 70 days, they weighed more, but every other uh, group, the corn and soy free ones. Were significantly smaller than the corn and soy feed ones even this group at 64 days versus 48 you know two weeks later um they were still smaller in weights and, and we we were just yeah they were quite a bit um quite a bit smaller uh, chickens than we were hoping and took a while longer to grow um 
So feed type differences, the corn and soy chickens, they grew significantly faster, seven weeks versus nine weeks approximately to get to a weight that was saleable. Um, they had a uh, lower mortality. We, we had a lot more dye in those, uh, the corn and soy free ones. And actually in the, the first batch of the chickens that we brought in, they came from the hatchery quite sick. Something was up at the hatchery that was wrong and we lost like over a hundred, I think in the first day or two that they admitted something had happened at the hatchery that was their fault and they reimbursed us for them. But you could see the rest of the seven weeks that the corn and soy free chickens were significantly having significantly more health issues. They just never were quite bouncing back to the level of the other ones. So uh, the corn and soy free chickens were healthier, um, better feather growth, which I guess is just kind of a you know representation of, of health. Um, the corn and soy free chickens were better foragers. And the only thing I can really attribute that to is just that they were lighter. Um, they didn't, they, they did, didn't grow as fast and kind of have the struggles that some of those other chickens did, but their, their feed was significantly more expensive. Um, and so kind of that bottom paragraph there, when you include the fact that there were significantly more mortalities for more deaths on the corn and soy free chickens, more feed required, more time and labor uh, and the feed was significantly more expensive um, as well as less turnover. And what I mean by that is um, with the corn and soy chickens being able to raise them in seven weeks, we could, if we wanted to really tighten up our window, bring in chickens, you know, the next group of chickens when the first one is five weeks old and two weeks out from going to the processor, we could have the other ones in the brooder. If we really wanted, we could raise as many as five batches a year. Um, or in our hoop house, that'll be 3000 chickens. Um, with the corn and soy free chickens taking nine weeks, if, even if we were as tight as we could, we could only do four batches. Um, and so what I mean by less turnover then is we can, we, you know, that overhead of $10,000 investment and stuff, uh, whatever that annual depreciation is, we can split it across 3000 chickens versus 2400 chickens. And so those, it's more cost per bird and depreciation or overhead expense for those uh, corn and soy free ones. All those factors together make corn and soy free chickens significantly more expensive. And so it's not that you can't or shouldn't raise them. You just need to know your market. Um, and what we would recommend or going forward, if we're ever going to raise them again, is we're going to have pre-orders and we're going to raise what we have sold, maybe a few extra, and we're going to have deposits and know that we're going to sell them and we need to charge what it's worth. Um, when we listed what we needed to make them sell uh we didn't sell very many and fortunately the grant you know helped cover some of these costs that made it still work for us but uh but going forward uh, you know or anyone who wanted to raise those chickens know what your cost is um because uh you need to charge that or you won't make money and your customers need to know before they order or before you know that that it's going to cost that significantly more so um we also sent in samples for nutritional testing um, to see if there's any nutritional difference. Um, the, the blue is corn and soy uh, chickens and the red is corn and soy free. Um, the, uh, uh, you can see there was, and I'm not a nutritional expert, so I honestly won't talk much on this, but the omega-3 to omega-6 fatty acid ratio is significantly better in the corn and soy free. Um, we worked with a professor from the University of Minnesota who just, you know, attributes a lot of that to the different feeds that were in there, the flax and uh, different, you know, actual feed contents. And I won't uh, pretend to be able to know much about it, but in case you're interested, here's just a few of the things. Alpha tocopherol, I believe, is a type of vitamin E or vitamin C. My wife is listening to this and will probably text me telling me if I'm right or wrong, um, but it's one of the vitamins. And so it was kind of neat to see that the corn and soy free chickens were probably uh, a more healthy and nutritious meat product for the consumer, but the corn and soy free diet was not necessarily better or more healthy for the chicken itself. Um, this line is maybe hard to see, but I don't know if you can see my cursor here as I'm moving it. There was on this day, the photo maybe doesn't do it justice, but you could clearly see a line where to the left we had raised chickens. Uh, we had, with this hoop house, gone back and forth and back and forth along this fence line 
Um, you can see it was right next to a road. We had a lot of glares and funny stares from people, but it was, it was okay. Um, but there was a clear line in dark green, more productive grass on the left where the chickens had been versus on the right. And this year was kind of a drought year too. And so it looked more drought stressed and heat stressed. And it was pretty neat to see um, how different that, that was. But um, that's all I have for my talk um, here. And I uh, see there's some things in the chat, so I can uh, open it up now for questions for Lance or myself at this point. I'll try and go through here and see if there's some questions. Um, are they four week, at four weeks, are they corn and one and a half pound corn? How much do you pay for processing? Uh, how much do you pay for processing per bird? So where AA poultry is $4 per bird for processing a whole bird. Um, I think it's more if it's over seven or eight pounds. And then if you want to cut up, there's an additional charge there as well. Um, where do they normally stay at night? Uh, where do they normally stay at night? Uh, they're, they're in that hoop house day and night. Uh, that hoop house has moved forward every day. Um, to new grass and I uh, hate to be negative, but these birds are bred to be meat machines. They don't really have a life. Um, it's, it's, <laughs> it's true, they're bred to be meat producers. Um, we like to think we're giving them as good a life as we can. I've got videos I had meant to put in there, but I didn't have these birds like they do move around. I got one chasing down a worm and eating a worm. They, they get to scratch and peck and, and they eat a lot of legumes and forages. So we try to give them the best life, but we've found that for our market and for our um, demand, our customers love the product um, and uh, we're raising them the best that we can. Um, we found just the opposite of corn and soy versus corn and soy free chicken mortality rate. That's interesting uh, that Julie said. Um, that's that's interesting. Uh, were the feed trials using organic feed? The corn and soy free was organic and the corn and soy was non-GMO. Um, our professor did say that part of the issue with the feathering, especially in some of the other health issues might have been related to organic has a limit on methionine or something in the feed and that that has been found to maybe correlate to some health things as well but uh, organic certification requires that so that may have uh, had some correlation to that. Um, yes, Ellen, but the world loves protein chicken is a way to um, Valerie, my wife, just put some of the pricing uh, in there and that for a poultry. She also texted me here and mentioned that something that we may consider in the future that is something to consider is there's a clean company, clean chickens and company or something that does mobile processing. They'll take a semi out to your farm and can do USDA inspected chicken processing on site. And that may be something we look into in the future because right now we, we have 50 crates or whatever we got, we load them all up into uh, chicken crates and haul them an hour and a half to a, a poultry. Um, and so uh, uh, it, that that may be something we do just to save the hassle. They're a little more expensive for processing, but when you take away the, you know, the hassle of driving all the way out there, they're probably cheaper. Um, let's see, where the Cornish straight run, we uh, got all males. Um, so the straight run means they send you a mix of both males and females, and uh, we want as much consistency as possible. We've heard is the females grow significantly slower, and so just for consistently, we raise all the males. Um, somebody made a comment here that they raised Red Rangers one year, and the family didn't care for the taste. They've raised Cornish Cross, and they taste amazing. That's what we found. We just love the taste, love the quality. Um, they are bred for growth, but we're pretty comfortable with the lifestyle we give them here, and they do they do quite well. Um, the night question was related to the ATV. Yeah, so those chickens, um, <laughs> uh, we, I think that was the second batch of chickens of a year that we were raising three batches of chickens. And because they took so long to grow, by the time we had the next batch of chickens coming in and through the brooder and ready to go out to pasture, these chickens weren't anywhere close to being ready to process. And so we, uh, we, at that point, um, we kind of built a little pen of cattle panels and a little shelter we made out of wood 
and we put all those chickens in there and every day we'd let them out run free roam and then try and move them back in there at night but like that particular day we got out there too late um and they all charged the the uh the side by side and then uh, the sun went down and they just ended up like sleeping under there so we did try and lock them in at night but honestly uh we didn't have any more hoop we didn't have any more chicken uh houses and i didn't want to build another one for these chickens that weren't going to make us any money and were just losing us money and making us more frustrated every day so we more or less let them kind of free range and just kind of do their thing and we had feed available for them if they wanted it but that was kind of what they did um can you raise Red Ranger and Cornish Cross at the same time? Um, I suppose you could. You'd have some done earlier and you'd have to go out and pick them around. I'm not sure, uh, pick them out, the ones that were ready. I don't know if there would be any health issues or anything between those breeds. Um, did they escape the greenhouse? I don't know uh, if that was a question for one of Lance and his greenhouses or if that was our hoop house. Um, we never had any get out. We never had any um issues with them uh getting out the one issue we had a couple times was chickens getting into another pen uh and so we had a couple that we had to you could clearly see if there was a corn and soy free chicken and with the corn and soy we had to move a couple back but um they never got out that uh that thing was pretty darn uh, solid and we never had anything good in either uh clean clean chicken oh yeah lance made a good comment here on the clean chicken company uh, the mobile processing, they have a 200 or 250 chicken minimum. Um, man, comments. Keep going up here. Um, we bought all of our crates on Amazon, actually. Oh, well, I shouldn't say that. We bought quite a few on Amazon, and we bought about 25 from a local producer who was stopped, uh, stopped raising chickens. We got a 25 from him, and the rest we bought on Amazon. Um, we found the cheapest ones we could find, but they're not cheap. Like I think the cheapest ones were 50 bucks a piece that hold maybe nine birds, eight or nine birds. Um, so it's, it was an investment just in chicken crates, but from what I've seen, the demand is there that if we need to sell them, uh, we can get most of that money back. So, um, how much 20% feed per head for grown return? I'm not sure what that question from Tom is how much 20% feed per head for growing term. I don't know if you want to clarify that question in another one. I'm not sure what you mean by that. Yeah, I just thought oh. on um, just uh, what your average daily cost for feed per chicken would be if you had to like say 100 birds. How much feed would you expect to utilize from day one to slaughter per bird? Uh, if, have you ever averaged something like that out? Or yeah, we have a graph. I don't have it. I want to say it was, gosh, was it roughly? Val, well, correct me. I think it was between two and a half to three pounds of feed per pound of finished bird that we got. So if our average was five pounds, we fed roughly 12 to 15 pounds of feed um, uh, for those birds. And I don't have the specifics on that at the moment. So I apologize for that. But um, it, I think, yeah, no, I don't. I don't have that. Sorry for specifics. Uh, if I could just interject one other question for your yeah, feed, you say a feed you fill your feeders once a day. Mm -hmm. Is that because could you put a bigger feeder in and feed less frequency if you had an automatic setup like it would just like a bigger bin? Or do yeah. you want to not feed as much so that they get more free range versus feed? No, they pretty much always have free access. So theoretically we could put bigger feeders in or more feeders and not have to feed them as often, but we're going out to move them once a day and check them once a day anyway. And so we didn't have any problem with just filling a few at that point. And honestly, for the first few weeks, they're still so small that we weren't filling them, but if, you know, maybe for the first few weeks we could top them off uh, or the first few, week or so anyway, for sure, we could top them off and not fill them again for two or three days. Um, so it really wasn't enough of a hassle to make us want to look to try and make it more efficient by getting more or bigger feeders at this point. Um, maybe, maybe that'll change at some point if we did more feeders or more hoop houses, but, um, that that's, I guess what we thought. Yeah, um, what, yeah you bet. Tom. Thank you. Uh, what do you consider acceptable loss with the Cornish cross? Um, yeah, that 10 to 20% is. The best we did this year was uh, just under 10% with the corn and soy 
feed, the corn and soy feed was, we had batch two, I think was just under 10% uh, death loss. Um, but I would probably realistically expect 10, I mean, if you had 15%, I would be, I'd be content. Um, obviously we're always working to try and reduce that. And um, yeah, we're not pros at this either. We've been doing this for three years now. So, um, and this was the first year using this hoop house style. Um, what date do you put your first batch out on pasture? I would have to look back. We had them go to butcher on June like 15th or well, we were supposed to have them all go to butcher June, like the week before our baby was due. Um, and then we ended up having the corn and soy free ones significantly have to stay significantly longer. But so whatever seven weeks prior to June five weeks prior to June 20th would be was when they would have gone out on pasture. So mid-May, and we probably could have done earlier. The hoop house that we have um, is actually like a greenhouse. It has, like, has roll down tarps on the side that you can roll down. And we have a shade cloth on it in the photo there. The black was a shade cloth, but you can take that shade cloth off and it's like a greenhouse. So you could do them earlier in the year and later in the year if we wanted to. But um, we were only planning for three batches this year. So we didn't feel a need to push it earlier in the spring or later. Um, um, clean chickens never going anywhere else. They're great. They're getting a lot of plugs for today. That's good. Um, Lance has seen five to 10% what we've found. Yeah, I don't know. Lance, do you have some comments on some of these questions too? You raised pasture chickens. Sorry, I'm just totally kind of rolling through them. You're good. I, I mean, I don't disagree with anything. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, no, you're good. Um, yeah, if there's something you, you've you had experience on any of these, jump in and, and answer them. Sorry. Um, what was the daytime temperature on day two? On the day we put? I don't know what the daytime temperature was specifically. We just tried to pick the nicest day when we were in that week two to three, is what we would try and do. Um, my wife just put a link to the Amazon uh, place where we bought the crates. Um, so you can take a look there if you'd like. Um, Julie says that their chickens are using one third of a pound of feed per chicken per day. Um, what hatchery do you prefer? Um, Lance, I'd be curious to hear what hatcheries you use as well, but the hatcheries we've used are uh, Hoover Hatchery, which they were great except for sending us the Delawares. And then I think it's Cruz Hatchery. Uh, we, they were great except for sending us the one batch that had sickness problems. <laughs> so I think we've used two uh, hatcheries so far and both have been great except for the exception. So it seems like, I don't know, maybe everybody has problems, but Lance. Yeah, I would agree. We used Hoover's on one batch and then uh, a couple different hatcheries out of Wisconsin. I forget their name. They're out of, I think, Beaver Dam or anyway. We go through um, uh, High View Feeds is where we source most of our chickens, and they have two different companies that they put chickens in every week or every other week uh, on their truck. So, sunny side, that sounds about right. Yep. Um, have you sold, Lance, actually, I think there was a question earlier that I maybe forgot to answer in one of those ones, and I should go back to those, but uh, somebody asked if we sold chickens in grocery stores, and we have not, but we're, we're, we want to, and we're open to it. Lance, I think somebody asked maybe previously both about eggs as well, uh, if you've done any wholesaling uh, or anything with that. Um, we have not, although I have several friends that sell eggs to, uh, mostly to restaurants, um, not so much to grocery stores, uh, in discussing with them on the restaurant, you know, some of these higher end restaurants, you know, they're looking for that type of product and they're willing to pay for it. And it doesn't really matter to them what Cisco or some of these other options are that they can buy cheap, you know, eggs or meat or, you know, whatnot. So, um, but I don't have any direct experience, but I think you need to look at, what do you want to make per dozen? You know, what's your cost of production? Um, because yeah, that's uh, there's a lot of eggs that sell for two to three, four dollars a dozen. And yeah, I just think we need to be careful when we run our numbers. Same thing with broilers. Like we're looking to outsource 
our brother grower or, you know, who somebody to, to raise our brothers for us. Um, on that question for you, Lance, I find, I scrolled back uh, and found kind of the questions looking at selling at stores or restaurants. And then in addition to that, there is, are there any regulations in the way um, on the, bro the laying hen side or broilers? There probably are. I mean, I don't know. I guess I haven't looked at it. I just have, you know, a handful of friends that sell locally and I don't mm -hmm. think they do anything differently, but maybe they mm -hmm. do. I'm not sure. Sure. Um, do you know if there are any legalities around leaving eggs unrefrigerated in the farm stand? I can't say I do because we're not selling anything through a farm stand yet, but I know I have some neighbors that sell them that way. So I assume there's probably a certain shelf life that, you know, Department of Ag or somebody tells us that we need to, you know, have them sold by. Cool. I uh, scrolled down to Lisa's comment on one of our wives being amazing and having met at a U of M conference. I haven't met yours, but I'm sure she is as well, but I'll make sure to tell Val if that's who you're referring to. Um, let's see, now I got to scroll back down. Um, I don't know if you see any questions, Lance, that are related to yours. Um, you have a couple about picking them up on the farm or online. I oh, think they're probably directing it to you. Sure. Do you, do your customers all order online and then pick up at the farm? So we have a freezer space up in the Twin Cities, actually, where we have a bunch of chest freezers. Uh, we just rent a kind of a basement storage space there just to make pickup more convenient for our customers. Um, they all order online and then they pick up there or we can do delivery within the Twin Cities or they can pick up on the farm. Um, where we'd like to go is to uh, um, getting some sort of a big on farm freezers here and then a freezer van and doing everything delivery direct to door or maybe offering a pickup location in the cities but not having an actual uh, location in the cities, just like in a parking lot where they can come get stuff out of the van or something. But that's the route we want to go. So we're not having to, so everything is here and we don't have to drive all the way up there to box and package and things like that, just to try and simplify. A um, uh, couple people made comments about Sunnyside uh, Hatchery. Um, <clears throat> sounds like they're happy with them. Um, looking for someone to raise broilers for me. We're interested. <laughs> um, yeah, we, my wife and I want to scale the chickens. We see that as the opportunity to try and, uh, like I was talking about earlier, be home farming. I still work for the Sustainable Farming Association while I love my job. The goal is to be home farming and, and kind of pastured chickens is easier to scale than other things. And so we hope to, you know, seek out more wholesale markets um, with, uh, with our, our broiler birds. Um, just mm. to scale that. Uh, it's kind of exciting where you, I mean, like the the potential of what Dane was talking about with tree range chickens, they put the numbers together and on like six acres with four of their buildings, you could make 60 or $70,000 a year or something like that. And the way we see it is if we can wholesale make three or four or five bucks a bird um, somewhere in there and we can raise 10,000 birds a year, which is not labor wise unreasonable. The market is the challenge, but labor wise we can do that in two or three hours a morning for five months a year and generate 30 to fifty thousand dollars a year so we're excited about the potential of broilers as a, a way to increase revenue for our farm so that we don't have to look at raising crops or something to to make a living that we can we can do it on pasture and on, on, on pretty productive grounds um what do you expect for the price per pound on birds this season we sell our broilers for five dollars a pound uh, retail um uh, more if you cut in in cuts but whole birds that's that's our rate um, um yeah kelly anderson from mda actually just shared in the a link in the the chat to a value added grant that's available through mda to purchase things like delivery truck or farm freezer space. And um, I think that one offers 10%, I'm not 10% of investment costs up to 25%. Okay, cool. So um, 
Yeah, and Val just put our website in there, grassfedcattleco.com, if people have any. Val is my wife, if you hear me keep referring to Val <laughs> in the chat, but uh, if you have any questions for that. Um, it is 7.30, so I, I want to respect anybody's time. If they want to take off, you're welcome, but I'm going to try and keep searching through these questions. Sorry, I'm less organized. Usually I am kind of keeping track of them while the other people are speaking, but I kind of got caught a little off here when I was doing my talk. But um, thanks everybody for your questions and um, and your thoughts. This is This is fantastic. A question for Lance, is there any size grading for the egg? Um, we don't, uh, mess around with any of that right now. We, you know, when our pullets came in and they're much smaller, we just kind of let people know, but we didn't discount price or anything like that. And we're not to a point where we have, you know, 500 eggs a day or anything like that, as far as sizing, but you know, if we get there, I guess we'll deal with it. So, yeah, yeah. Um, well, that's awesome. I'm, if you had like the thing that I'm curious for Lance, the thing that's kept us from doing eggs is most of our customers so far buy bulk meat. They buy an eighth or a half a pig. And we're nervous about going down the laying route because how do we, I don't know if all of our customers are used to buying bulk. Now we have a product that needs to be picked up a little more regularly. Does that, has that been a challenge at all when you've got customers buying bulk maybe for some of your meat products as well as a more regular item? Yeah. Let me, um, and yeah, I think that's a concern. I mean, some, sometimes with our egg subscription, people will want, instead of getting like, uh, one dozen or two dozen a week, they want, you know, two dozen every other week or three dozen, you know, every third week or something like that. So, but I think there is a real, yeah, you want to be careful of that because they're, they are perishable and, you know, but, um, so far, um, we haven't had that issue, although we're not, you know, we're not pushing, you know, 200 eggs a day quite yet, you know, so. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Cool. Um, Lance, there was a question for you on where you get your pullets, but before you answer that, there's also somebody, uh, Kelly Anderson shared in the chat here again, rules related, related to selling eggs for people. If they want to check that out, there's a link there in the chat, but um, where do you get your pullets, Lance? Uh, I want to say it might've been sunny side. Uh, so one thing I found is you, you look at these, these hatcheries and they don't necessarily advertise that they have, you know, 12 week or, you know, different pullet ages, but so I called them and then, yeah, they do actually, you know, do a limited quantity in certain breeds. So, uh, we, we booked with two different places. I, I want to say sunny side, but I guess I'm not hundred percent sure. Um, and we were looking for like Americanas and some specialty, um, breeds. So, um, yeah, I don't have a real good answer for you. Sorry about that. You can, yeah, if you want to shoot me an email or call, I can look into that too. So, awesome. Um, I apologize if there's questions I missed. I was jumping around trying to find them. So, if there's any more that I, I haven't answered, that if you could retype them in the chat, just so I'm not struggling to try and find them in like 100 there. Um, but uh, otherwise, I, I don't know. Uh, if I've missed anybody. Thank you guys uh, for real. Uh, I'm not taking off until everybody else is gone. So if there are more questions, feel free to leave them. Um, this will be up on YouTube here, hopefully not too long. Um, if um, if you want to participate in the cohort, I'm going to try and get an email sent out to everybody. It's been ending up in people's, I, I did one for the hogs and it ended up in a lot of spam boxes. So check that. Um, uh, Lance put his email in there, lance.classic at gmail.com reach out to him if you have any more questions. Um, mine is jared at sfa-mn.org. Feel free to reach out to me. Um, uh, otherwise, thank you all so much for, for hanging out and um, answering questions or asking questions and listening and reach out anytime if you got any more. So thanks everybody. <laughs>